Good morning and welcome to day four of the 10th Bendigo Invention and Innovation Festival. I'm Jonathan Ridnall. Today's conversation, revolutionising industry through AR, VR and the Internet of Things, will begin in a few moments. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that we are joining you from Jajawa Rung land. I'd like to pay respects to the traditional owners who are the first scientists, technologists and innovators who for thousands of years have been stewards of their culture and land. I'd like to particularly pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge that this session's partner is Voslo and our contributors are Deakin and La Trobe Universities. Now, I've done this a few other sessions. I'd like to do it now too. You are watching us with a screen with a type your question box next to it. Use it now to send me a shout out. Whether you're around the corner or on the other side of the world, please send us your name, where you're tuning in from, and we'd love to say hello back. And there's an ulterior motive to the shout out. It also makes you aware that you can use the type of question box to uh, ask questions right through your present or our presentation. And I'll make sure that your voice is heard as part of the session. Well, digitization, augmented reality, and virtual reality, as well as the Internet of Things, offer countless advantages for industry, business, and communities. With rapid returns for investment and considerable productivity gains, these technologies offer better decision-making and improvements in efficiency. And now for the most jargon-filled sentence of the Innovation and Invention Festival so far. Today we will explore the use of AR, VR, digitization and the IoT for Industry 4.0 applications. And of course you know what that means, don't you? Well, let's meet some people who do know what we're talking about. Simon Edgerton is La Trobe University's Deputy Head of Department, Computer Science and Information Technology. Wei Zhang is La Trobe University's Cisco Chair of AI and the Internet of Things. And Ben Horan is Deakin University's Director of the Cadet Virtual Reality Simulation and Training Research Lab. Good morning, panel. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Ben, I'm going to go start very basic, if that's all right with you. But before I do, I should say Rod says hello from San Diego, Chris from sunny Bendigo, Kay from Bendigo, and Victor is greeting us from Melbourne. So keep the shout-outs coming for a few more moments, and uh, we'll look forward to those. And then use that button, of course, to um, make sure you ask some great questions of our very well... Oh, Joe from... Oh, Melodiousness. I think that means from... Melbourne, and Peter from San Francisco. Ben, basic definitions first, if you don't mind. Augmented reality and virtual reality, what are they and what's the difference? Okay, very good question. Virtual reality attempts to take us away from our real world and immerse us in a virtual environment, while augmented reality is about overlaying digital information on top of what we're seeing. So if we've seen the movie Minority Report, where Tom Cruise is has a screen in front of him, he can still see the room, but also interact with the data. That might be a, although science fiction, example of augmented reality, but whereas virtual reality is, is more about taking someone away from that environment. So imagine the matrix where you really, in theory, can't differentiate between the two. Okay, that kind of explains it. Can you give me a, perhaps a um, AR, um, augmented reality application IRL in real life? <laughs> sure. So I think one of the, the, the holy grail applications that people want to use in their everyday life is being able to walk around with a, a pair of augmented reality glasses and receive contextual real-time information about where they need to park their car, how much it's going to cost, which turn off to take and so on. And I think one of the um, ways we'll see this is in heads-up displays in cars in the, the near future where information will be displayed on the windscreen and you can see it while you're driving. Okay, so fighter pilot technology coming into other places is a very simple AR application. Very much, very much so. One of the AR applications many of us will have used, although it is very simple, is Pokemon Go. So with Pokemon Go, you'd walk around with your tablet or phone, uh, find a Pokemon, and once you did, it would pop up on your real-world view of the environment. Way, do you think we're going to talk a bit about computer games in this conversation about AR and VR? It, it sounds like, in some ways, games as well as our business community and government leaders will be uh, using this technology. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think so. Yeah, I think that the VR and the AR technology is uh, having the potential to revolutionize the way we live our life. Okay. Uh, not only just for the entertainment, but like uh, Ben just rightly pointed out, it's making 
you know, the, the, the sort of like windscreen, you know, because I'm driving a vehicle with a windscreen, uh, windscreen overlay, and I just find it fantastic, maybe make a life uh, driving a lot easier. But also I think the government can use it as a, as a, a, a decision-making tool, you know, uh, for better engaging with, uh, uh, with audience, uh, with uh, people from all walks of life. Okay, cool. Which then brings us to the third in our trilogy, the IoT, or Internet of Things. Simon, can you give us a basic demonstration or, or answer to that question? What is IoT? That's uh, another, very good, uh, another very good question. I, I think uh, a simple answer is just to turn, <laughs> turn that around and say, well, the Internet of Things are just really things that connect to the Internet. Um, I, I think if we take that concept, then um, the idea of things connecting to the Internet has been with us for a while. Um, back in the 80s, we were connecting our desktop computers to the, inter uh, to, to the Internet, and then it became laptop computers, mobile phones, and tablets. But I, I guess we, when we think of our laptops and mobile phones, we don't really think of those as IoT devices. So I think the follow-on question is, well, if IoT are things connected to the Internet, what is an IoT device if, if we don't think of our desktop or laptop as an IoT device? And I think a simple answer to that is um, an IoT device or an IoT thing is something that wouldn't traditionally connect itself to the Internet. So you might imagine your toilet seat, for example, connecting to the Internet or your, your chair or, you know, you might... if. You might have a, a more traditional, you might have a conveyor belt in an industry setting connecting to the internet. So, so can I give a practical example? I went on a holiday with a couple who looked at the weather forecast on their um, mobile phone and said, oh, it's a bit warm in Geelong. And we were on the other side of the country and said, I'll put the sprinklers on for half an hour. Is that an Absolutely. IoT application? It, it, it is, it is. So IoT devices, they connect to the internet and they can be used for sensing things, for example, like weather information, but they can also be used to act out in the environment. They can make, you can uh, remotely do things in the environment, like turn on, turn on your sprinklers, shut the blinds if the sun is coming through your north facing window uh, in, 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 in the evening. So I, the abstract, I think the abstract way view of looking at IoT, it's really applying technology to everyday things to help us, you know, extract information from the environment. And then we can start to do useful things with that information, like turn sprinklers on, start the car in the morning, turn the kettle on, uh, start, start our toast for early breakfast. <laughs> Way, I think I read somewhere that at the moment there are probably more IoT devices than people on the planet. So we are talking about billions. And so we've heard how a lot of people are talking up 5G as essential to the Internet of Things. What's the relationship between those two technologies? Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, 5G provides as much needed connectivity to IoT devices. And it is a widely held you know, uh, misconception. I would like to take this opportunity to clarify. And a lot of people I think uh, is think uh, 5G in comparison to 4G is faster, you know, uh, more bandwidth, more bike, uh, you know, a white band. Uh, that's not entirely right, yeah, because uh, uh, compared uh, to all the previous 1G and 4G, 5G is not only just a, a super faster, but also 5G is the first mobile uh, phone standard designed for connecting to billions of Internet of Things devices. And many of them are running at very low uh, speeds. So 5G not only is being you know, high speed, it can be very low speed, yeah, because it's connecting uh, a billion, so like you said, yeah, more than yeah, the, the number of humans on the on the planet. Uh, there's a lot of okay, so 5G is not just about, as you say, the speed of doing things, but it's actually been designed to be the connect connectivity, almost like the the mesh that joins everything together. Yeah, a 5G, I was thinking, you know, an analogy would be is all around it, so it can handle. Uh, very fast, uh, you know, require very high uh, bandwidth uh, devices like your mobile phone, yeah, or, or you know, your, your tablets, and also can handle very extremely low uh, speed, yeah, and also large quantity of devices like the weather sensors. Okay, so one more clever dick question from me before we move on. Simon, 
would it be easier to say which parts of our lives will not be changed by AR, VR and IoT than the other way around? I think that's a, a very difficult question. I, I, I think uh, IoT will revolutionize, revolutionize our lives in every aspect. Um, there was a, a, the cover of The Economist um, late last year had the title across it, IoT will change the world. And the article, re reading the article, you get a really good sense that IoT will change the way we live, the way, the way we work, and, and the way we think. So I think IoT will change our lives okay. um, over the next 10 years, but I, I really hope that it doesn't change our humanity. So I think that won't change. Okay, well, I've used my IoT example of a sprinkler system, but Ben, I'd like to now drill down with each of you to talk about a project that you've been involved with that can really set home, I suppose, the, the beginning with an idea to the thought process to get through that one of these technologies has created a solution. And um, at Cadet VR Lab, you've, You've developed a lot of things. Which one would you like to uh, talk about this morning? Look, great. It's, um, the one I'd like to talk about is a project which was uh, multidisciplinary. So we're working with nurses and midwives, and they came to us with a, at the start, a, a broad um, question. Can we use virtual reality and virtual reality technologies to train nurses and midwives in palpating intrapartum contractions? So there is some jargon there, but how do we push down on the fundus of... Um, a pregnant woman, and feel the contractions so that we can better train for when that happens for obvious reasons. It's hard to provide that to a classroom of students needing that essential skill. So we took that concept, we worked together over about six months and ended up coming up with a new technology whereby we can put on a virtual reality headset, we can see and hear what's happening in a simulated scene, but we also developed a haptic technology where we can push down and feel the contractions. Um, we did it keeping the cost low, making sure it was mechanically robust so it always worked when needed. And um, and I say that's one where we've taken the concept all the way through to a real-world application. Okay, so it was coming with a particular um, problem to solve. And I, I suppose that, you know, being an old Luddite, if, if an, a hammer and chisel could have sold it, you could have used that. But this one... And you're going to have to explain the word haptic to me. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, if we think of virtual reality where we put on a headset, we have visual information that we see, we have audio that we hear, but haptics is relating to the sense of touch. So in some applications, we really need to interact with our hands and other parts of our body, and these technologies can sometimes enable that. So in some ways, you are integrating 3D modelling of a a pregnant woman along with headsets and along with um, technology that makes your fingertips sensitive as well. Very much being able to interact with those three sensors rather than just the two. And silly question, does it work? It does, it does. So we obviously with this sort of thing, we want to work closely with the stakeholders. So we have the stakeholders who have, you know, collectively 100 years of experience um, between them. And then we tested what we developed with nurses and midwives in training as well as experienced ones. And it does replicate well enough. The thing to keep in mind with these sorts of technologies is we're often comparing against nothing because it's very difficult to find that thing in real life. So if we can do it better than the alternative, which is drawing it on a whiteboard or explaining it verbally, there isn't a, a game there. And we want to match it then with the available real world experience and try to get a, a really good balance. Fantastic. Simon, for you, um, I'm going to choose your topic for you, if that's okay. Um, oh. I've seen a web page with many, many little micro weather stations around the city of Bendigo. Tell me how that's an IoT project. Sure. Well, uh, this project started uh, roughly two years ago. Uh, the, city count, the city of Greater Bendigo um, came to Latrobe and they posed the question, can we, get, can we use IoT to generate um, high definition, high resolution weather data in real time um, from within the city? So at the time, there was only one official recorded data point for weather across um, the, city, the city of Bendigo, and that was held at the airport. And I think for those of us who live in Bendigo, we know how unrepresentative the, that weather information um, is for the city. So we set about the idea of um, deploying, creating and deploying um, what we call weather pods. So these pods can sense environmental data, including temperature, heat, humidity, and also rainfall and deploy these across the city. 
um, to get to give us the information that we were looking for. And I think the way we went about doing that um, really helped engage us with the community. So part of the idea was, well, could we educate the community into the idea of what IoT is, what it can do, and why it might be useful for the city? So myself and uh, Chris and my partner at uh, the city of Greater Bendigo, um, on one, I can't remember whether it was a warm or cold morning, uh, we went into the ABC studios to promote the idea of um, asking members of the public to come forward and volunteer to adopt one of their one of these weather pods into their gardens, schools and homes. And um, we were on the edge of our seats because we didn't know how it was going to go. We didn't know whether the public would buy into this, they would, un they, they would see the value um, of the project. But within an hour, we were oversubscribed with volunteers stepping forward to adopt one of these weather pods. So we rolled out 100 weather sensors across Bendigo. And for the past uh, year and a half, we've been collecting real time weather data uh, across the city. And that's helping us to add value um, to the community. Now we're beginning to understand where the hot spots are in Bendigo and during winter, the cold spots. I have to say that I'm living in Strathfield, say, and I'm really understanding the meaning of its nickname, uh, the winter fields. It turns out to be the coldest spot in, in Bendigo. So, you know, if you're living in Strathfield, say, you need to turn the heating up a bit more in winter than you may do someone living in Epsom or someone living in a city. So it's producing, a, it's giving us a wealth of um, information to help us understand how heat affects the city. But Simon, it has to do more than just be an interesting conversation piece saying, I live in a place colder than you. What are the actual <laughs> applications of this IoT project? Sure. Oh, so um, one, of the, one of the heat events that happens within cities over the summer periods are these heat warning days. These are, these are periods during the summer where temperatures don't drop below 32 degrees. And when that happens, this can have a significant effect on vulnerable populations. So the data that we're collecting is helping the city um, understand what areas around Bendigo experience these, these kind of conditions. And feeding that data into the city planners can help them understand how best to um, react or cope to those to those events. So it can actually help the city plan for um, longer periods of hot weather, for example, that, that a changing climate's going to bring on? That's right. That's right. Yeah. OK, cool. OK, well, that's citywide, and that sounds pretty big with 100 sensors. But uh, Wei, I want you to, uh, to expand on IoT. Can you talk about a, a project that's even bigger than a city? Yeah, I, I did something very interesting, and I think most Australians will be very uh, interested, and that's use the Internet of Things uh, technology to help saving our reefs. Yeah, the Great Barrier Reef up in the far north Queensland. Yeah, I think uh, you, yeah, a lot of us haven't heard about uh, too many, you know, the headlines in the newspaper, both nationally and internationally, and that's about uh, you know the reef is uh, is uh, is doing badly, very badly, and and reef is being risked. Uh, you know, being uh, delisted de 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 from the U uh, United Nations uh, World Heritage List if we don't act in no time. So the problem, because uh, I've been uh, lived in the far north Queensland for five years, so the problem up here is that the reef is suffering two things. The first is human activities, you know, the human waste, the sewage water discharge, and pollution, urban pollution. And the other thing is that the farming activity, because up in the far north, there's a lot of that, like super cane uh, farmers. So uh, whenever the farmers apply the, the pesticide, for example, yeah, and 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 if unfortunately you you, you call, uh, there's rain, you know, very soon, yeah, and then a lot of the pesticide uh, end up in, in the uh, Great Barrier uh, Lagoon. So it's all about timing, and it's all about uh, how we control the sediments, you know, whatever we discharge uh, into the Great Bear Reef. Uh, so to solve the problem, uh, to help, uh, we monitor the reef, the internet of things, the technology, yeah, is what we used. So we chose, a lot of the previous study has been, you know, chosen, you know, to investigate farming activity and how they impact on the, on the reef. But the, the project we did with Kansas City Council was looking at uh, its work first, uh, 
Great Barrier Reef, a real-time uh, monitoring system in an urban area. So we chose a catchment, urban catchment area. Yeah, it's a creek uh, in the middle of the Cairns, and just uh, we deploy a number of sensors just uh, uh, on the riverbank, you know, uh, uh, leading to uh, the Great Barrier Reef. So what we did is that, you know, the sensors, we build a gauging station and we put sensors in the water and they monitor data and they upload the data uh, 15 minutes update uh, every 15 minutes and or shortly if you want, yeah. And and we built a cloud-based uh, dashboard and we open it up to public. So anyone can see, yeah, whatever you do on a daily basis in Cairns and how your activity is impacting on our reef. And those information, you know, it's very nice, not only just visualize the impact, but also uh, it comes with a so-called predictive analytic in the technology. So, you know, so you sort of like it can, can come up with a so-called reef health index. So that index will help uh, not only uh, citizen science, yeah, but also uh, yes, council uh, staff in terms of decision making. Really interesting. To me, Ben, those two examples show that IoT in particular can be a way of involving communities in, in what can be fairly large problems. For example, in Bendigo, planning for climate change. For Way's example is actually monitoring how a community can impact on the health of a really valuable natural resource, and yet they're done publicly in a way that everyone can participate. Is it a de democratisation of, of information in some ways? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, this is what we call, uh, you know, citizen science. So the beauty of using Internet of Things is that you, know, you, you, you have a lot of senses, and you don't have to personally deploy those senses yourself, and you can ask community, you know, our, our, our citizens to contribute in terms of collecting data, like uh, like uh, uh, Simon just mentioned, you know, uh, city of Benico, uh, resident collect one of the sensors, put them in, 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 in the backyard. And we are sort of like planning similar things. A lot of people going out to the, to the sea with uh, the boats. So, you know, somewhere in the boats, you can, it doesn't take much uh, effort to carry out a sensor. So that's, uh, yeah, something we are, we are looking at. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, the more the data you can collect, the more sensors you can, you can deploy. And I think that, that will better uh, help in the decision-making process. Excellent. This is the Bendigo Invention and Innovation Festival. Uh, you're watching on your computer or mobile device. And, of course, it's got the Ask a Question opportunity for you as well. So uh, we'll be going to questions in about five or ten minutes from now. So now's a good time to throw in your question as well. So if you've got a question about all these three technologies, IoT, AR or VR, please ask them right now. Um, during a talk, way you mentioned the idea that the data collected through in, in yeah, IoT is not necessarily useful. There are other things you need to do to it first. And, and Simon, maybe I can get you to touch on this. That is, creating terabytes of data is one thing, but it's not really useful until you know what to do with it, is it? Well, that's right. I, I think if we, if we look at the, the volume of data that our weather network has generated. We're looking at we're looking at millions. Sorry, I forgot to turn off my mobile phone. Look there. You did tell us beforehand. I'll throw that on the floor. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So our weather network has generated millions and millions of data points. But um, unless you have a strategy to work with that data and turn it into some useful information that can help people make decisions, it's it's kind of doesn't mean very much. So I think that's where. You know, Waze area comes in with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, applying those technologies to try to understand uh, that data and turn it into something useful that people can use and visualize and really do something with. So that's another side of this developing technology is not just to create the technology to make sure that it's readily accessible and useful and understandable. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Ben, I believe that we need to ask you now a question so that you can actually um, prepare your show and tell. Um, you've got a, a short slideshow to uh, represent some of the things we're talking about? Yes, absolutely. And it'd be great to share what we're doing with the audience. OK, take it away. Thank you. OK, so as we've discussed, virtual reality can help us immerse ourselves in environments that we may not have access to or they may not exist. And 
it's not always about just the video and audio that we have in virtual reality. So this is very much our our focus. And like I mentioned before, it's not necessarily about replacing training that can happen already. Uh, one of the long-held examples is flight simulation training, where for a very long time, about 80% of it has been in the simulator, although they weren't, they weren't virtual reality as we, we think of now, but, but, but similar, and then about 20% in the plane. So the technologies have moved on quite a bit, and we work with industry partners, um, a little bit like Simon and Way, to to help solve their problems. And I mentioned the, the midwifery and nursing um, training before, but um, there's another one that we can look at here, which is, is a bit more industrial and does require more than just sight and sound. And that is how do we train remotely in safely operating complex plant or equipment? And it is very important that we, of course, as I mentioned before, collaborate with subject matter experts so that we're in fact um, solving the right problem and that we know that what we do works. So this was with Melbourne Water, a very large um, water provider and utility provider in Melbourne. And they wanted to train people in isolating an ozone generator. So it's a large piece of plant and you need to know how to turn it off safely. The problem being that you need to have access to the machine, which is, of course, in use in disinfecting water. And you may not necessarily have the trainer with you. So there's two problems there. So how do we use virtual reality to solve this? So we were able to take all of the CAD models that already existed, um, computer-aided design models, 3D models, and recreate this in virtual reality, and then create some underlying architecture whereby one trainer anywhere in the world can then train multiple trainees all in the same virtual space. And the question that Wei spoke before about 5G, we, we know that at the moment connectivity is not always great. So how can we do this when we have really low connection bandwidth and high latency or, or large amounts of displays? And then back to that multi-sensory element, when, when shutting down a piece of equipment like this, you need to use your hands. It's not the same using a keyboard or a controller. So we worked with Melbourne Water closely over about two years to develop this system where there are multiple field deployable units. And then inside the virtual environment, you see avatars representing the other people. Um, we can track your hands, you reach out, you grab the valve like you would in the real world. And then you're also learning the motions that you need and, 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 and muscle memory you needed to perform those tasks. So here is a video of this being demonstrated live. So in that particular example, we wanted to be quite ambitious and it's about taking the, the, the public and, and industry along for the ride and, and, and demonstrated this from China to Australia, which, which does have quite high latency and low bandwidth. And as you can see, the way it was designed really, um, it really worked. So that was great. Now, that, that's a very industrial application, but what about something a little bit closer to home um, in Bendigo? And this is a current project where we are working with the City of Greater Bendigo and other, other project partners to look at how these same technologies can be used for raising awareness, in this case around heavy vehicles and the challenges that they face on, on the road. So how can we take learner drivers between 16 and 18 years old, put them in an immersive virtual reality experience and put them in the shoes of a truck driver so they can better understand the challenges around um, making a heavy vehicle stop in a hurry, turning circles and all that kind of Kind of stuff. As far as we know, this is the first time this has been done. And again, very much involves those subject matter experts and stakeholders. So the subject matter experts being those that understand the challenges, truck drivers, uh, regulatory bodies, um, and so on, and then the end users so that they can help inform the design as it happens with the view to have the best possible outcome at the end. 
Okay, well, two terrific examples there, Ben, and I think you might have actually answered Paul's question, who wanted to know how, a, how can a me mechanical engineering company who undertakes installations globally employ AR, VR, or IoT to assist installer technicians in remote applications in live time? And I guess that you can say collaborate and we can do it. Yep, definitely, and I think you know, that's the virtual reality version where you're taken offline to do it, but, but the extension of that would be using augmented reality so that you receive that similar information while you're performing the installation and maintenance. So certainly a possibility. Okay, I've got a question which is from Kay, and I'm not sure who should answer it because it's, it's probably the big one for a lot of people tuning in. For businesses that are not well versed in these technologies, where would you suggest you start? Is there any advice to help the culture and learning curve associated with these, for many of us, brand new technologies? Who wants that question? I can, I can start and possibly be joined by the, our colleagues here. I think this is the role that universities are, are increasingly playing. We, as part of our core business, do research. So it's research and teaching, really, at least from my perspective. And um, working with people that have an industry that have real problems to be solved can be, can be really fruitful. But I don't know that a lot of people are aware of this. And, and how would you... Um, embark upon finding out a, a university partner with the right skills, and <clears throat> pick up the phone, send an email and, and ask the question. That's certainly how all of the projects we've presented have started. Okay. Um, good way of talking. Are there any other strategies to ensure that, to, to use the old Lilo and Stitch, no one gets left behind, Simon or Way? I think it's, uh, as Ben said, um, it's about industries, I think, coming forward and talking to the educators about the latest technology that's coming along, such as uh, AR, VR, and, and IoT. Um, I know universities at La Trobe, for example, we are putting, we have programs to um, and courses that uh, members of the uh, public can, can join uh, to, to, to start understanding this uh, uh, technology. So I think it's just a process of communication engagement between industry and university. It's really interesting, while this is the Bendigo Invention and Innovation Festival, what I've discovered being part of it is that festivals like this are really important as well because I've learned so much about extraordinary manufacturing, extraordinary mining techniques that I knew nothing about until I was part of a panel learning more about them. So we need to basically um, talk more about how the 21st century has completely evolved manufacturing, business, our, our social lives as well and, and make sure that people do know and have the confidence to have a go. Okay, take that as a comment. Let's go to some more questions, shall we? Um, Paul, I guess, has gone the other side though. We've heard a lot about uh, the danger of hacking and the internet of things. Um, way, as far as being secure and being a secure network, if there are literally billions of things connected to the internet, is that my way as a international hacker to, to get into people's bank accounts? That, that, that's a good question. I think that a lot of people are scared by you know, the concept and notion of we're surrounded by billions of devices and they're collecting our data, they're monitoring where we go, where we're going, and, and they're watching what we're doing. That's a scary thing. So if those are data, you know, those trusted devices get hacked by other people. Yeah. And I think from day one, uh, since I started the you know working on the Internet of Things, yeah, that that was uh, you know if I were ever to uh, nominate a number one question, that's most uh, the common one. But my message to people out there is that uh, I mean the bottom line is nothing is one hundred percent safe, so we can't have a guarantee safe. But the benefit then you have to make a decision: the benefit versus the risk. You know, whether you know you you, you like it or, or it's uh, it's you don't like it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, maybe the best way is for me to use an analogy. You know, in the old days, if you, for argument's sake, you go to a big shopping center, you lost your wallet, and the chances are you're getting your wallet back, uh, depending on how, 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 how much luck you, you had on that day. Alternatively, these days we don't do, you know, a lot of us don't use uh, real money, we use virtual money. So we put money in the, in the, in the bank, or, you know, you, or, or we pay using. Apple Pay, for example, I think the chances of your money is being getting lost, you know, by someone else hacking into it's way lower than you lost your wallet in the shopping. Good example. So think, yeah, good it's, example. It's, it's actually 
it's helping you. So it's, it might sound scary, but I think it with that the, the, the latest and most advanced uh, security technology in place, I think we relatively have a peace of mind. Yeah. Joe's asked a question which I think also brings home, though, that this is about um, computer companies actually behaving appropriately and having to rebuild bridges. Um, Joe mentions um, smart cities. IoT is necessary for smart city strategies, but some express real concerns over privacy. A salutary example is perhaps the collapse of these sidewalk labs in Vancouver, because so many people felt that Google just wanted it as another avenue of gathering data. Um, is that, again, big tech acting badly and ruining it for everybody, or is it a real concern? Um, well, I, I, yeah, there's a, a you know, concern from community, that's for sure. But I think a lot of data, you know, even though you know, not, not only just government collecting data, but also the private company providing the data, I think they have obligations. You know, in some in the term of references, they, they are obliged to, to de-identify de those information. So I think, uh, you know, nothing to say, like I said, yeah, I just, you have to just weigh out the benefit versus the risk. Yeah, I think for the good of the public, a lot of the risk is, uh, is, is, is small and, and risk taking, but also we have to keep that in mind from day one, the IoT technology was designed and built with this huge security in mind as the most important priority in the design. So making the, the bits that are publicly accessible both safe from an exploitation point of view, but also useful for uh, both citizen science or scientists or whoever are using them. Simon, I have got a one sentence question for you, which I expect a one sentence answer from. And this could be uh, because Peter Mulqueen is a bit um, homesick on the west coast of the US. He asks, is the weather station data being collected in Bendigo accessible to Bendigo's citizen scientists through an app or similar? So where do we find out more about this? Yes, it is. So if you go on to the Bureau of Meteorology's web portal called BOM, you will find all the data there for download and you'll have access to an API through the Met Office. Okay. Ben, I'm going to ask you this question from Stuart. And uh, we've been talking about which pits parts of our lives will not be touched by this. But Stuart wants to know, um, can you give some ideas as to how you would use these technologies in tourism or galleries and even retail? I think the um, when it comes to, to virtual reality, it's about looking at the value proposition. Is there, Can you benefit by being provided access to an environment that doesn't exist or it's difficult to access? And I, what's happened with COVID is we've all started to, to really think carefully about what we need to access. And if we Oh, I guess we, we can't at the moment. Um, so, so, so yes, for all of the above, I don't think it's a direct replacement. I think in the case of, let's say, tourism and school groups who want to go on study tours, clearly going in real life, you're going to have a much richer and authentic experience, but it's not going to be possible to visit every, every country in the world, let's say. In virtual reality, it might. So I really think it's looking at it, um, understanding what the technology can do and then looking at it um, in terms of balance. And there are starting to be some really good applications out there where people are using it for, for tourism and the like. Yeah, I'm kind of interested, have any of you actually ever had someone come to you with a problem saying, we need AR to do solve this problem for us, and actually said, no, there are probably simpler and less technological solutions to your problem? Yeah, absolutely. And, and when we spoke before about reaching out to a university to start to discuss, you know, collaboration and working together and very much, you know, I, I'm in a school of engineering as opposed to a school of, of, of computer science. And I think that's quite important with virtual reality because there's a quite a, a lot of technology that goes into making a virtual reality or augmented reality experience. So understanding the need and then what the solution can do the technology can do to provide a solution to that need is very, very important. And most people don't, don't fully understand the, um, the, the complexity of the field. So, so certainly I think it's about working with a collaborator who's going to take you on a, on a short journey to explain what can do certain things and, and what can't. Okay, we've got about 20 minutes left of this conversation um, and we'll get to some other questions, but I want to have a mini hackathon right now. We've got a real life problem that's come up and let's see whether or not we can workshop a solution. I'm a Bendigo based manufacturer. I install fairly complex engineering machinery around the world and I want to make sure that I can do that efficiently, safely, and do follow-up service as well as I possibly can. How would I be looking at these technologies and how much would I be perhaps expecting to spend to make sure that I could be based 
a, a maintenance supervisor in Bendigo actually perhaps helping a maintenance staff member, say, in Chile? I think I can possibly oh, start. Yeah, oh, question. they're all leaping in. This is brilliant. Um, ben, you've been talking a lot recently, so okay. <laughs> we might start with Simon, if that's OK. Got any ideas? I, I think I would start looking at the retrofitting market, particularly if the machinery that you're putting in is already established, and looking at, looking at what IoT sensors, uh, how IoT sensors could uh, instrument your existing model, uh, your existing apparatus. And the idea would be to bring all of that operational data from the remote location to your locale here. So you could um, have a good operational overview. Um, you could start to do predictive maintenance. You could um, have a view over um, if the machinery was being used in the right in the right way. And I think all of that adds to operate operational uh, efficiencies and cost saving. Okay, so one is to actually be able to, in real time, measure what this piece of machinery on the other side of of the world is doing. And can we hold that thought also about predictive maintenance? Because I've got a whole question about that. But Wei, you also wanted to, to mention uh, whether how you might be able to develop a VR, or well, one of these three technologies to really help that with that global company. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say, you know, without the internet of things and technology, the traditional way of man maintaining the machinery is you fly. Yeah, you fly to your customers, you know, periodically and you check them every every half a year or, or every six months, 12 months. With Internet of Things technology, it's going to make your life a lot easier. You don't have to fly, particularly in the year after COVID-19 we're facing now. Yeah, you can't fly anyway, Yeah, but you don't want to left your customer stress. So the idea is to install the sensors, you know, uh, monitoring the health condition of the machinery so you can have real-time uh, data collection and you see, yeah, you can, you know, in, 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 in your computer, in the dashboard, you can see how, how where they're running, uh, whether there's a wear and tear in some particular places. And that was uh, actually what we did with uh, a mining company in, in uh, northern uh, Queensland. It's a conveyor belt, yeah. And we installed sensors underneath the conveyor belt, yeah. And the, the, before we do that, before we did that, you know, they, they, they do the maintenance, you know, on a regular basis every three months. They send mechanicals, uh, technicians are actually physically checking the conveyor belts, uh, the rollers are uh, underneath the conveyor belts. That is but with sensors, uh, we see everything on the, on the screen and give you a warning, yeah, red light warning if something particularly yeah, needs attention. Okay, so this is where two phrases which I really picked on because, Ben, I, I think that I saw them in some stuff that I was reading about you, servitization and predictive maintenance. This means, as Wei and Simon are basically saying, you don't need to send the techie or your virtual techie every six months. The machine will tell you when it needs to be maintained. Yes, and I think um, it's certainly the way things are going. The first step is, is like Wei and Simon were mentioning, making sure that the, the real-time data is there so decisions can be made. Then on top of that, there can be all sorts of um, more efficient business models and, and, and very different to what we've seen in the past. Um, I, th I think that, you know, this is where the, the crossover between um, all the fields we're talking about here today can, can really come together. We need that information to be able to make good decisions. And then part of uh, the, those, those different response measures, um, whether they be predictive maintenance or being able to respond very quickly, could be benefited from, for instance, augmented reality technology to help in real time. Cool. Um, I've got a really interesting phrase from Melanie, and I can do my best Tony Jones and say, this is a comment perhaps rather than a question. Melanie says, I love the statement, IoT will change our lives, but not our humanity. Um, I'm hoping that one of you will disagree with that, because in some ways, all you have been talking about is talking to the people who will be using this, either as the problem solver or the person who will be using this technology to, to do the thing. So can we be good develop humanity with these technologies? And I'm going to ask you first, Ben, because you've got the biggest smile on. <laughs> Thanks. Look, I think um, possibly Simon meant that it's not going to change our humanity in a bad way. And I think I'd argue that I think it's going to change humanity in a positive way because the more we know, the, the better we can be. And um, IoT is really a plays a large part in bringing together all of that information. So I'd say I, I disagree with with um, Simon's statement, but but it, yeah, I think we, we mean the same thing. Excellent. And some didn't mute their internet uh, email either. Um, 
This one too, and without being breaking any commercial incompetence, let's use that example of um, working with Melbourne Water, for example, to create a maintenance program or maintenance training program virtually. What kind of dollars are we talking about, Ben? Are we talking millions, hundreds of thousands, or just change behind the couch? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, it, it obviously varies project to project, but we're, we're talking uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a, for a proper program. Um, however, it, it really depends. We have undertaken other projects which were, were tens of thousands and were quite small. Even some projects where we decided that it was better to upskill the, the, the collaborators so that they could do what they need to do using, say, 360 video. So it, it really does depend. But I guess what you'd always want to do is make sure that the money you spend is going to be um, less than what you would have spent otherwise. Okay. So um, there's an economist sitting behind some of these decisions as well, is there, Ben? Yes. I, mean, I think, yes, technology, we need to understand you know, the economics as well uh, to make sure that what we're doing really does benefit our partners. I'm, I'm kind of wondering then, because these three technologies are the next big thing, are you hearing from various corporations saying, my board says we have to get into this stuff because we've been told we have to? Uh, is it actually more uh, about don't come to me until you have a problem, as opposed to don't come to me and we'll help you implement one of these things because they're cool. I'm not, not sure about um, what Simon and Wei think, but I think that most organisations have these technologies somewhere on their digital um, strategic roadmap. Um, in our experience, the, the projects that we've got off the ground have come from the bottom up. So I think there's definitely an awareness from the, the board um, top down that these are the things we need to be looking at. But then the um, bottom up uh, operationalise those into to really good ideas and, and, and um, turn into projects that really make an impact. OK, well, optimism through innovation. And we are the Invention and Innovation Festival coming live from Bendigo. And Simon, I'll ask you this question. Julia basically wants to know, for people interested in upskilling in this area, where should they start? Uh, well, a very good place to start would be with Latrobe Bendigo. Um, as we uh, launched uh, a new master's program in IoT this year, so I think that would be a perfect fit. And Julia, more than happy to talk to you offline about this. Okay. And are you finding appropriate courses popping up at TAFE level and university level across the, the country and across the world way? Uh, yes. So I think we are running uh, some, you know, the so-called... Uh, uh, micro credential short courses. Yeah, a lot of Australian university, not only just like Charles, even though we are proud of yeah, the quality of our short courses, particularly in AI, IoT, and data science. Actually, so. Micro credential courses are, are short, like a six or seven weeks. So, very good for our community our members who are looking to upskill uh, their, their, their knowledge and experience expertise in this area. So, and also, if you started, yeah, a short course is not enough then welcome to sign this Master of IoT course. Fantastic. And, and Ben, we better not let your university uh, off the hook and uh, just talk about Latrobe. But I, I sense from Wei's answer that um, 21st century education for 21st century technology, not necessarily a three-year course that you need to do, but, but some of that micro-learning that is being much bandied around at the moment. I think that that's an, that's an important thing to realise. Depending on, on the, the, the level of depth and breadth that you need in your studies, you might look for an entire bachelor's degree, might be a master's, a graduate certificate, and even the micro-credentials, which are um, you know, similar to short courses, which are, which are really becoming more popular. And again, I guess, fuelled by this current situation that we're in. Well, that's interesting because there are two questions I was hoping to combine about the whole COVID um, pandemic and the way that it's been impacting on the way we do things. Necessity, mother of invention. Um, Anne says, the impact of COVID has significantly disrupted students, senior secondary, TAFE and university sectors, particularly undertaking work placements. And uh, they're wondering whether or not simulated workplace options could actually be used to help at least well, not completely replace, but certainly complement some of those experiences. And Ben, you're the most animated. You keep nodding as if you, I'm ready to go. Um, are you ready to go on this one? Uh, look, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Look, I fully agree. Um, I think we're all, um, like, like we are right now, using technologies to do what we needed to do. Certainly at Deakin University, we have placements as part of our engineering courses, and we have, and they're a requirement, we have had our students continue those through the great support of our partner organisations who have found ways to get a similar learning experience via technology. And look, I hope in the future, things like virtual reality and augmented reality are used 
used more. And I suspect it would be the, the same products that could be used for, for training and visualisation could also be used for work integrated learning and student placements. Yeah, I must say that my imagination is really into that idea that I have a really big expensive machine. I cannot afford to have it switched off just for training. So I will build a virtual machine and people will learn how to maintain it on a breakdown that way. That seems like such a simple but such effective way of, of increasing productivity. Definitely. If you'd like to add another piece of jargon to the mix, uh, so the field's starting to refer to this concept as a digital twin. So you have a, a digital twin version of that whatever it is, and it helps you do things offline. We should have a quiz at the end of this, shouldn't we? We really should. Um, let's go to some more questions here. Um, we mentioned before way no one should be left behind. Melanie would like to know what strategies can we be using to upskill older people in our community's ability to use IoT. Is this a young person's game? No, no, I don't think so. It's everyone's game. Yeah, so to start with, I think uh, uh, the good way uh, for elderly people to engage uh, with the IoT technology is just to play with it, you know, rather than, you know, learning the right stuff, just play with it. There are too many, yeah, off the shelf IoT gadgets. You know, many of them uh, are run households. Yeah, to start with, you can you, you can you can using a, a home. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure if you you know you guys have heard of it. Yeah, so there's a, a home speaker which you can interact with, uh, with humans. Yeah, and you can control using uh, the, the the speaker to control your garage. For example, you just open up a garage. You know, rather than you have to press a button to open it up. You know, turn off the lights. You know, turn on my TV, etc. Yeah, make your home a smart home at the first time. Play I'm, with it. I'm sorry. I'm suddenly thinking one of the early IoT applications was the Home Alert necklace, which um, basically, if uh, an older people have probably been part of the IoT for longer than most of us, you fall down and this thing through your wireless system calls an ambulance. If that's not IoT, what is? Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. called a fault detector. Yeah. yeah. And, and the wider concept, you know, it's a, it's a so-called a variable IoT uh, census, and that can actually help you save your life in some circumstances. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's definitely a way to, to looking at it. And, and, and the older members of our community are increasing using that technology. For sure. Um, a lot of people are asking questions about um, how we make sure that the community is prepared to be part of this. And Deb wants to know, um, what about at primary and secondary school level? What kind of course offerings or what kind of programs can, can excite young people to think about careers or or applications for IoT, AR, and VR. Simon, you're looking like you need to answer this one. Yeah, but I would say, uh, similar to the last question, um, get the students involved with um, the off-the-shelf technology that's available. Um, the BBC, um, they do a fantastic piece of kit called the BBC Microbit, and they have a lot of IoT connectivity and IoT sensors that go with that. Um, kit. I know a lot of schools are into that kit. And get the students involved. Go out to the community. Ask them what their challenges and problems are and get students involved in co-creating solutions for, for their issues. And I think that was a good way of connecting the young, young, young generation with new technology into community problems. And I think there's nothing better than putting stuff together and seeing it make a difference or seeing it help someone out in the community. So while we're talking about perhaps some examples that do take significant investment, there are projects at classroom level or even, say, in Bendigo, where it has a science and technology centre and a tech school, there are places where people can actually get their hands on this stuff and, and as you said, way, have a play. OK. Well, it sounds scary, but it shouldn't be. Is that what you're trying to tell me? No, yeah, yes, that's that's right. Yeah, we shouldn't be, yeah. Uh, my my words for people out there is that just go for it. Okay, brilliant. Um, Andrew's got a long question, but I think it's worth talking about. Let's call the the clever weather IoT project in Bendigo a success. Um, how can other people put forward city and community centric problems that may potentially be solved with an IoT application? How do we actually kickstart that conversation? Um, Simon, you did the weather project. Perhaps you have an idea, a few ideas about telling people where they can start. Yeah, so, so I think this is really, um, I think, one, from a community perspective, um, the idea of organising a community group 
um, in collaboration with uh, the city council and a local university um, around the idea of um, just trying to identify what what city problems there are in 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 in, in smart city in the smart city space, and then pulling pulling together uh, people who can who can work on the problems. Um, I think nowadays uh, there are various accelerator programs where you can pitch ideas to. So the idea of coming together, producing, uh, putting together a minimal viable prototype that perhaps could be put forward in in, in an accelerator program. Uh, I think this technology lends itself to innovation. Um, you know, we're all used to the idea of um, automating traditional ways of doing things, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in innovating new ways of doing things and creating new business models. So I think, uh, I don't know what they all are yet, but we're having fun finding out. Excellent, and I'm terrified because we only have two minutes left to finish off our conversation. And I must say, talking about innovation, I found that the question screen is not just about firing questions at me, but now Anne and I think it was Paul are having a conversation on our, on our messaging system to talk about how to follow up some of the concepts that we're discussing today. So great innovation going on there as well. Um, to, to wrap it up then, it seems to be that um, these are simply tools like a hammer or, or a gosh, a, a whisk. So in some ways, while it's all very new and all very exciting, it's really about solving real world problems. So this is not about coders in dark rooms. This is about communicating with various parts of the community. So um, Wei, I'll get you to perhaps uh, finish up with that idea of how or where this technology is going to be taking us as communities and as countries rather than as businesses or schools. Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, the, the technology is there, yeah, uh, and uh, it, it's going to take, take some time for people to to trust the technology. Yeah, it's just like you make a friend, you're not going to trust your friend from day one. Yeah, when time goes by, you start to trust of, of your friend more. And the same goes with new technology, particularly with the IoT and, and artificial intelligence and, and the AI, and the AR, and the AR, yeah. And but I think yeah yeah it's like it, it took uh, you know the the, the society uh, around ten years or even longer to get used to the internet yeah let's see how the internet has transformed uh, our life and I would argue the internet things will do uh, you know to uh, uh, to human life in a much greater degree yeah so watch out in this space and when time goes by and a lot of people will embrace it so my uh, yeah again just go for it and embrace the new technology. And I suppose, how many people wear an IoT device on their wrists these days to make sure they get their 10,000 steps? Simon, for you, um, is this the next big, big thing? Um, use your crystal ball. This, this will be with us for a long time, won't it? AR, VR, and IoT? I, I think it will. And I think we are right at the foothills of where this technology will, will lead us. So I think these are really exciting times as we see this technology mature, develop, and really become more pervasive. Fantastic. And, and Ben, your closing statement for uh, this session. I think um, the technology is there, AR, VR, and IoT. It's all around us. So um, experiment, get involved in hackathons um, and things like that. If you want to take it further, talk to a university or like um, Simon was suggesting, go and pitch your ideas somewhere. And it's really something we all need to contribute to to take the sector forward. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but there are still many more inspirational speakers and sessions over the next few weeks. You can act access the 2020 B Bendigo Inventor and In Innovation Festival app through your browser or through your mobile device to add more free sessions. Further details, of course, at biif.com.au. And talking of engaging young people, don't forget our fabulous STEAM Day at the Bendigo Tech School tomorrow. The day will include an International Women in STEAM Forum, a Taste for Tomorrow, an introduction to 5G and IoT networks with Telstra Dev, and a Girls in STEAM electric car project, and one for parents and teachers getting the most from inquiry-based learning. And this afternoon, we're celebrating food. Come back in two hours to hear Jar Jar Warung Clan's leader, Rodney Carter, give an update on two exciting food initiatives. They'll be about realising the potential of indigenous grass and fish as food sources. And straight afterwards, celebrity chef Toby Puttock will be bringing us back into Bendigo with a Bendigo-inspired masterclass. And that'll be followed by Bendigo Tech School broaching the topic of sustainability feeding the world. 
As usual, all details are on the Bendigo Invention and Innovation Festival webpage and app. Thanks again to our session partner, Voslo, and to the two universities that have provided our speakers, Deakin Uni and La Trobe University. And thank you again, Ben Horan from Deakin University and Simon Edgerton and Wei Zhang from La Trobe University. Thanks so much. And thank you. Thank you for joining us for our conversation, revolutionizing industry through augmented reality, virtual reality, and the Internet of Things here at the 2020 Bendigo Invention and Innovation Festival. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>